Scholes is the John and Dorothy Wilson Professor uh, in MIT's Brain and Cognitive Sciences Department, where we are, um, and also apartment, uh, Associate Department Head uh, and leading researcher in early childhood cognition. Uh, her work explores how children develop core knowledge about the physical and social world through absolutely fascinating uh, experiments. You can see uh, hopefully some today maybe, some previews, and on YouTube as well, go check it out. Um, uh, fascinating work with infants and young children about how just such uh, rich cognition can arise from incredibly uh, limited data. So with that, Laura. Thank you so much, and uh, thanks to the organizers um, for inviting me here. I'm coming at this a little bit from uh, left field, but I was really interested to look, especially at this idea that's now come across many talks, about the, the use of games to understand human intelligence, and especially this notion that the ability to efficiently acquire new skills is core to human intelligence. And I think that this seems almost axiomatic. We are incredibly powerful learners. We do efficiently acquire new skills. But I'm going to actually spend most of this talk calling into question the idea that that is actually the distinctive and important feature about human intelligence, even when we talk about play. This isn't, by the way, to challenge the notion that games are an incredibly useful and valuable tool and that they're going to tell us a lot about learning and about AI and we'll be able to develop sophisticated models and make advances in this. But I have been studying actually play my entire career. I started in graduate school, so 20 years now. And it struck me as I was thinking about this workshop that I've never once studied games. So what's the difference between thinking about games and thinking about play? And I think. I can capture a tiny, tiny bit of it in a study that Junyi and I did a few years ago, which is I can give you an example of rational, efficient action by an intelligent agent in a really simple context that generalizes this child was told to go get stickers in this room and takes an incredibly efficient goal-directed action to the stickers. <laughs> <laughs> this is not terribly surprising. I could have given this task to an 18-month-old and gotten exactly the same result. Here's what happens when we ask the child, hey, there's stickers in this box, can you play in here? And go get one. And the main thing I want you to notice is the child does something inefficient, right? This is not an efficient action. It appears to be a fun one because the child actually goes back and repeats it, then does it backwards, doesn't actually achieve the objective function or the goal, delays achieving it. That's play. Here's another example. I need to fill out this form. Can you go over there and try to get a pencil? The child is a very good goal-directed agent, <laughs> quite efficiently goes over and retrieves a pencil. Same uh, rim. Can you play over there and try to get a pencil? And now the child does an extremely inefficient action, taking advantage of the fact that we'd stuck pencils to the wall. But actually, it's now out of reach, so the child jumps up for the pencil repeatedly. This is a costly action for the exact same reward that they could have achieved efficiently and did previously. And in fact, the net child now invents a new tool in a minute because the child can't reach. Oh, oh but the child, child already has a pencil, but wants another pencil. So um, uh, decides that that's the new goal right now, not having a pencil, but getting a new pencil. And in order to get the new pencil, uses the old goal as now a tool to the next end and eventually succeeds in whacking off that second pencil. This isn't extraordinary, folks. This is typical. Right? This was more a demonstration almost than an experiment. Right? Kids play is not action. And I've spent a career, by the way, trying to make, bridge the gap between computational models of learning and children's play and showing rational play and showing the ways it is efficient learning. And I actually abandoned that in 2012 for a while because I was like, look, I'm learning a lot about learning. I'm learning almost nothing about this ubiquitous human behavior of the world's smartest organism. The only organism on the planet who solves all the hard problems of cognitive science. I can build models that show the link between learning and play because I can use play as a dependent measure of everything. But I am not actually exploring what's going on in play because play doesn't look like what I'm setting up in my designs, right? If I just leave the stimuli in front of the kids, I can't predict what they're going to do, right? I can't predict what one child will do from one time to the next. I can constrain it so that I can make it work. But that isn't actually what's going on in early childhood. And in some sense, I knew this from my dissertation work. I set up a box. There were a couple of gears and a switch. There were a lot of causal possibilities. The switch could make the yellow gear go, which made the blue gear go, or the blue could make the yellow, et cetera, et cetera. And we wanted to know if 
by just playing with the gear toy. The kids would find it out. This turned it up to a perfectly respectable paper with, at the time, a perfectly respectable model of children and learning. But these are the outtakes from my dissertation. <laughs> Okay, these children are generating the evidence, although in a somewhat chaotic manner. Oh. The green oh. I can hear it inside. But it's way louder and, and stillier. Right. So I often say at this point, you wouldn't be laughing if it were your dissertation. Because of course, the environment you all have created up is much more tractable. But this is the real deal. This is human intelligence. And I have, again, known that from the start. Those kids in there might be in the audience any day now. They're 25 or 26 years old right now. <laughs> I worry about this every time I show that video. But I, about when I gave up is when my youngest child was born. So Josh Tenenbaum suggested, oh, I know what we should do in play. Hierarchical reasoning. We should use stacking cups, right? Because they're a really great model of what you might learn and learn efficiently through play and action. You could learn these hierarchical. So I was like, great. Let me go give my child some stacking cups. You want your mommy right now? Yeah? Okay, you want me to, you want me to, does it with your mommy? Yeah? Okay, okay. okay. You don't have to. Okay, you can. So we're reuniting the octopus with its mommy <laughs> in the stacking cups. Um, that is actually the goal that we set ourselves here. But you She tells me, just in case I missed it. <laughs> OK, that is playing. So what I just want to put out here, although I am hugely supportive and admiring of all the efforts happening in the name of these games and these really tractable spaces, is that there is a danger of looking under the lamppost. We can get AI to play in grid worlds, and we can get AI to play with objective functions that we establish, right? And we can reward them for achieving those. And that is great. But this is like a small outtake of the reasons why I stopped working on play and started working on social cognition for a decade until Junyi came back. And we started thinking about, OK, what's the broader picture here? Because what is really distinctive about human intelligence is, I think, not the ability to play games. Right? Those are clearly defined spaces, even when they're at their most rich and abstract, even when you have to infer the goal and the problem together. It's the fact that we bother to invent them. These objective functions have no objective function in the real world, right? I mean, right now there's a huge market for them, so maybe there's an economy around them. But we've been doing this for thousands of years. Go was invented with a bunch of stones when no one was selling those things, right? So we are motivated to develop arbitrary problems for no end at all. What is up with that, right? What are we doing with that? Why are we interested in those kinds of problems? So what I want to suggest is that at some point, it would be useful to solve all these problems, I absolutely agree. But in a paper that Jin Yi and Josh and I um, put out last year, I was trying to think about this kind of broader space of things, because we do make progress in learning. We do learn efficient actions and efficient action plans. I think many animals do that, actually. And I think they do it fairly flexibly, actually, in a quite a few environments, right? Check out New Caledonian crows someday. But what we do is we invent all new problems, all new goals. We move the goalposts that well. And it is our ability to create and invent altogether new objective functions, right? Flexibly design plans around them, change them, revalue them. That, I think, is really kind of the core of human learning. So with that, we'll end. Thank you, Laura.